The chi-squared test is a simple summation looking at the differences between the observed frequency counts and the expected frequency counts. So all we're doing is looking at the difference between each frequency count, squaring that difference, that makes all of our differences whether or not they're positive or negative, and makes them positive values, and then dividing by EI, the expected value that we would see there. So essentially, each of these fractions can be seen almost like a percentage difference from EI. The reason why it's not a percentage difference from EI is that we are squaring the numerator here. So it is slightly different, but it's not too different to that. It's at least helpful to think of it in terms of the difference between the observed and the expected as a fraction of how much, how big the expected value was. Now, under the null hypothesis, we assume that the observed distribution, or the counts, OI, will equal the expected counts, EI. In that case, the difference between OI and EI is going to be close to zero. And therefore, when we sum across all the I's of these percentage, of these differences, then we'll find that the chi-squared will be close to zero if the null hypothesis is true. If, on the other hand, there are significant differences between the observed frequency and the expected frequency, well, then the chi-squared statistic is going to be a large positive number. Each of these numerators will, be, will always be positive because we're squaring the difference. So if there's a big difference, the square will be big and positive, and therefore the sum over all of these differences will be positive. So in order to prove, or in order to have enough evidence that the null hypothesis is true, we're going to have to have a chi-squared test that's not just bigger than zero, but it has to be beyond the reasonable doubt. It has to be, be a chi-squared that's so large that it's not probable that that large chi-squared was just due to sampling error alone. So in that case, the chi-squared test for goodness of fit is always going to be a right tail test. So for example, if this is the chi-squared distribution like this, chi-squared can never be less than zero because the, this numerator can never be less than zero. So the sum, the, you know, the, the, the smallest this chi-squared can be over here is zero. And that's when the null is true. HO is true. Now, when we go out and collect a sample, well, we might get a chi-squared over here. We, we might get one over here. We might get one over here. How do we know which one is enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, to reject this case over here? In order for the chi-squared to be true, we're going to either define a critical chi-squared somewhere out here on the right tail, or for a given chi-squared, we're going to calculate the p-value of that chi-squared, which is just the area to the right of a, oops, I did not mean to do that. So imagine this is the chi-squared. The p-value, say, of this chi-squared is the area to the right. And remember, this is the p-value. So if we are going to use the p-value approach to test the chi-squared statistic, we use the rhyme. If p is low, the null must go. So if p-value is less than alpha, then we can reject. It's essentially the same thing as asking whether or not the chi-squared is more extreme than the critical value. The goodness of fit test is a test on a single random sample. In this case, the variable is organized into nominal or ordinal categories, and we, are, we have frequency counts for each category that form the input of the test. An important limitation of the test is that when we calculate the expected number of observations in each category, it must be that, that the that the expected value in each category has to be greater than 5. If we compute an expected value less than 5, then categories should be collapsed before proceeding with the test. Here's an example. 